My Mythological Narrative, written and narrated by Robert Crenshaw, featuring Don Dixon, Marty Jones, Mitch Easter, Mark Williams, Marshall Crenshaw, John Crenshaw, Gary Rinfrist, Bill Lloyd, Tom Teeley, and Graham Maybe. Original music by Robert Crenshaw, Kelly Ryan, Jamie Hoover, and the boys in the band. Some of you readers may have gone to my high school. For those of you who didn't, our football team was called the Berkeley Bears. Some of you may recall the day the bear got pushed off of the Berkeley High School roof. For those of you who don't, the bear was a six foot plus fiberglass and resin sculpture that probably weighed about 120 pounds. The bear stood on its hind legs and didn't look so fierce as it did faux regal with its aquanet fiberglass sculpted hair and its pepsinant smile. I recently found out that the bear came from Bald Mountain Riding Stables and was used for signage, perhaps warning you that your lunch may be stolen by a scavenger lummox if left in the car while riding. Coincidentally, it was lunchtime and me and hundreds of other kids were hanging around outside in the courtyard of the school. I was no doubt smoking a bum-cool cigarette when I began a conversation with my friends John and Paul. We began talking about what it might look like to see that fucking bear fall three stories to its death from the roof of the school's library. I wondered if it would shatter into a million pieces or just hit the ground with one mighty thump. We even discussed the possibility of it bouncing a few times, like an animal writhing in the last throes of life till stilled by the exhaustion of kinetic energy. It wasn't too long into the conversation before John and Paul decided to perform the experiment. I was a bit surprised, but John got that can't keep a good man down, this is science look in his eye, and Paul with his stoic generosity would always help out a friend. So off they went. As I was standing on the ground, wondering if they were really going to do it, I saw someone with a camera and told them that they might want to keep it ready. I began to think to myself, this is going to look great in the yearbook, maybe even make the inside cover. My level of naivety at the time could only be equal to my more general ignorance of human behavior, but still, I would love to know what happened to that picture, because one was taken. Moments later, chaos enveloped the courtyard as the mighty bear began its descent, yielding to the forces of gravity. As I recall, it hooked down over the side of the building and smashed a few windows of the library on the way down, falling with a mighty thump and fracturing the exoskeleton of the reluctant caniform, obediently obeying the laws of physics. Those brief but powerful moments directly following the incident reminded me of the scene in The Wizard of Oz when the Wicked Witch of the West is practicing her skywriting. The group of observers stood in terror as they watched the death of their beloved mascot. As I recall, there was an immediate call to arms from the varsity members who had placed the fallen bear atop of the temple. And I remember John fleeing the scene like a man who was about to be lynched, which he was. I remember observing and connecting his actions to fight and flight reactions we had recently discussed in a science class. I didn't know it at the time, but Paul reflexively fled to the office in a moment of spontaneous clarity to turn himself in, preempting the severe ass-whooping that surely would have ensued in the hands of the angry mob of jocks. I think to them, the jocks, it must have seemed like a personal attack on their collectively cherished achievement. That same achievement, just like the VW on the roof, that was supposed to appear as some spontaneous response to school spirit, but was recreated every year by the boys with the blue jackets as predictably as a nativity scene on the front of City Hall. For John and Paul, I think pushing the bear off the roof was their way of showing school spirit too. I think those who are disenfranchised from the high profile achievers want to leave their mark too. This was the 70s, goddammit. We had grown up during a period where civil disobedience was seen as an act of patriotism by some and scorned by others. 
For some of us, we didn't necessarily see the jocks as the enemy, but I think that on some level, they represented the establishment, or at least the good old boy network, which we were never going to be a part of. We didn't want to leave a big trophy in the big glass case by the main entrance of the school. We wanted to leave a steaming radioactive bowel movement in the big glass case of the main entrance of the high school. Perhaps in retrospect, in some cases, the jocks were like Nouveau Beaujolais, and we were like Cabernet Sauvignon, each with its own richness and complexity, each with its own set of metrics, and each with its own timeline. What did I expect? I expected it to be funnier. I expected there would be more acceptance and glee to the death of the bear. I expected spontaneous applause. You see, I was a dumbass, and a bit of a troublemaker, obviously. Most kids are dumbasses when they're in high school. With some regret, I'll admit, especially by that point, I hated high school most of the time and counted the days for it to be over. I think a lot of us felt that way. I left Berkeley High School with a D-minus average. For me, in many ways, it just was not a good fit. 